my remote I had to run back and get it and I got to use my favorite part of the building that little sneaky hallway into the sanctuary <laughs> but I do want to welcome you to worship as we think about faith and health we think about our differences and our diversity and I want to begin today with a very short reading from Acts In Acts 11, now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision. A couple weeks ago, we talked about that vision. Peter, kill and eat. Something like a sheet filled with non-kosher animals. Things Jews were forbidden from eating. Peter, kill and eat. Never, Lord. I maintain the kosher tradition. I maintain the law. Peter, this leader of the Christ followers, still attending to Jewish tradition. And we talked about how from that vision of food, Peter comes to understand what God is telling him is that the Spirit is with the Gentiles too. Those who are not Jewish, those who are not following the Jewish dietary laws or other religious laws. The centurion, this God-fearer, is nonetheless a co-equal worshiper. And they are included in the Christian community. It is a momentous occasion for Peter and for the church. And I wanted to remind us of that story and have that before us as we enter worship today and we talk about what it means to eat in healthy community. We continue our sermon series developed by the Healthy Congregations program that we are a part of. We've received a grant from them two years running now that are enabling us to do some exciting new ministries in Fort Scott. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. But as we gather for worship, I invite you to stand and join in our opening hymn, How Can We Name a Love? It's number 111 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
remain standing for our call to worship. Creator God, who made us to be living, feeling, communal people, guide us on the path to health and life everlasting. Saving God, who watches us struggle to care for the bodies you created, both our own and our neighbors, save us to live in health and life everlasting. Sustaining God, who made us to need one another and mourns when we choose division instead of following in the way of Christ, help us take care of each other on our journey toward health and life everlasting. Loving God, who empowers us to love one another, diverse yet unified in God's love, lead us into health and life everlasting as the body of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Galatians 2, 11 to 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are born Jews by faith and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified, not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one can be justified by the works of the law. But in but if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Thank you. 
Our second scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now that they think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God, we are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Our hymn of preparation is My Hope is Built. It's number 368 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
You may be seated. So we're talking a bit in this series about faith and health. I mentioned before many of the resources I'm sharing were organized by the United Methodist Health Fund and the Healthy Congregations program that we are a part of. Thinking not about what we should do, we get plenty of advice on what we should do for our health. And very often that advice comes loaded with guilt. And one of the things we struggle with is that advice that might be good for me is not appropriate for you in your health condition. And we get these mixed messages. And of course, the TV commercials are filled with simple pills that will solve all our problems. And yet I don't dismiss that for some problems, pills truly are life-changing. It's somewhat ironic that as I begin a series on health, I spent last week being as sick as I have been in a long time. And I'm sure now it's just allergies. But one of the things I think that has come good out of this pandemic that we are still struggling to get through is that a lot of us are a lot more cautious about just allergies. I could have pushed through this week even though I felt miserable, but I didn't have to. I sat down, I looked at the calendar, said, what is essential? What do I have to do? And at risk of undermining my role here, there really wasn't that much I had to do, at least not that week. Things could slide a day or two. There was one meeting that I thought, okay, my participation in that meeting is truly crucial. But everything else other people could handle, it could wait, it's not all about me. And so I took the time to rest. I slept a good portion of Wednesday and Thursday. And I took home COVID tests and they kept coming up negative and I started remembering to take my allergy med that Robin always reminds me to take. And I never do because I'm stubborn. And I'm fine, until all of a sudden I wasn't. And then those little pills really helped. You have other friends that have chemical imbalances and pills make them able to function. You know, I don't want to dismiss pills and vaccines and things, but I also think sometimes we rely too much on those kinds of things. We don't focus on our wholeness and our health. Of course, we gather today thinking about wholeness and 21 years ago was the attack on 9-11, D.C. and Pennsylvania and of course New York. And there are holes for those of us that were alive then. I spent some time talking with the youth this morning. It dawned on me this week, they're 14. They weren't here. I started thinking about what happened seven years before I was born, the heart of the civil rights movement and the assassination of Dr. King four years before I was born. And how do these things affect me? The moon landing when I was months old, I have no memory of that, even though somewhere there's a photo of me in front of the TV. How do we build community around these kinds of mountaintop and valley experiences how do we remember appropriately? A couple weeks ago I talked about remember as bringing back together, as building up, as a literal opposite of dismember, of division and acrimony. We remember best when we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Some of us remember September 12th, there was this incredible sense of unity in this country and around the world. And then for good reasons and bad, our nation again chose the path of war. And for 20 years, we were at war in Afghanistan. For 
17, we were at war in Iraq. Generation grew up with those wars, but those wars, I got to reflecting, didn't affect our daily life. For example, like the war of my childhood, Vietnam, where the draft changed our society and we were personally affected. You know, those of us that had members in the service, maybe we knew my youngest brothers did two tours in Iraq and you know, I was focused in and paying attention then, but for day-to-day -day life, it didn't affect us the same way. And certainly those of you who remember World War II and how that dramatically affected day-to-day -day life. How do we remember? I was talking with the kids a little bit. You know, September 11th is foremost in our minds. You know, even those of you who served in the military, I don't know that we spend a lot of time pausing for December 7th anymore. It's a day that will live in infamy, but it doesn't focus our society like it did. That's both good and bad. You know, I remember when nationally we would pause to remember mass shootings, but now there have been so many of them that they just kind of blur together. And other than maybe Sandy Hook, we don't remember specific. How do we remember in the face of division and tragedy? Much less seriously, but Ron Wood and I, as your lay member and as your pastor, we spent yesterday morning at a special called annual conference. It's how we United Methodists organize ourselves on a regional basis. All of the pastors and lay delegates from, uh, or lay members from Kansas and uh, Nebraska, the Great Plains Conference, shared in a special session to do some administrative work, the bulk of which was to formally ratify that 55 congregations are leaving our denomination. A total of 67 have chosen to over our debates over human sexuality, and yesterday was kind of that final moment. And yet yesterday wasn't all about that. Yesterday was really, and we've done a great job here in the Great Plains, despite some real division We've avoided, for the most part, the kind of acrimony we've seen in other jurisdictions, other places over this. Our leadership, even in our disagreement, have been very civil and kind. Yesterday, around that vote, leaders of various factions joined in prayer, sharing verses of the prayer, sharing leadership, even as we were dissolving our communion with those 55 churches. Those churches and a handful of others that used a different process represent about 6% of our total church congregations in the Great Plains and about 4% of our membership. Most of the churches leaving are quite small. There are a few a little bit larger than first, but most of them are quite small. But then we went on. We also did the work of this church, of this connection. We remodeled the governance for our Great Plains camping ministries, a project they, their leadership has been working on for a couple of years to make them more flexible, to learn the lessons of this last couple of years, to engage camping ministries in local congregations. There's some opportunities I'm looking at that would bring some of what they do here to Fort Scott to make us more effective in making disciples, in offering what we have as United Methodists to our communities. And that got me thinking, all of these memories and dates and events, and I was writing the newsletter article about how joyful I am that we've got clear glass on those two center doors and how I think it transforms the building, makes it more welcoming, and I hadn't taken in, for all of my talk of new eyes and looking around the building, I hadn't really taken in the front facade of our building. Up above those doors, it says Methodist Episcopal Church. Most of you are old enough to remember that we weren't United Methodists. We were Methodist Episcopal for your childhoods. 1906, up above, you can't really see it on the screen, but there's an oval that says 1906. That's when this building was built. This congregation was organized in 1866. Those of us living in Fort Scott probably know that date is real close 
to the American Civil War. Not just our church, but our nation divided over the issue of human rights and slavery. And it doesn't say so on the building, but if you're a bit of a student of history, our building says Methodist Episcopal Church. It does not, as the buildings at my seminary did, say Methodist Episcopal Church South. See, my seminary was in Missouri, and the ME South founded that building. We're in Kansas. The Methodist Episcopal Church North founded us. After we were founded, it was still, well, after this building was built, it was still 30 some years before those two factions of what is now the United Methodist Church came back together. We split over slavery in the 1860s, 1850s. We didn't come back together as one Methodist Episcopal Church until 1939. And then by 1930, 1968, we had merged with the Evangelical United Brethren and become the United Methodist Church. Old news. We don't, we don't spend a lot of time debating our church's stance on slavery anymore. But at one time, it was the focal point of our denominational fights. So yesterday, even as we wished 55 of our fellow congregations well as they go forth into other settings. Some of them are joining a new denomination called the Global Methodist Church. Others are going independent. But we did the work of the United Methodist Church and we did that work knowing that we are just one facet, one face of the universal church. That we've never all agreed on everything and yet the spirit is moving among us Together, even in our differences, maybe even because of our differences, we truly are the church, the body of Christ. So I want to switch to our scriptures today. Where does your food come from? Most of us probably don't spend a great deal of time thinking about that. I'm just enough of a city boy to know that the answer to that is the grocery store. When Robin and I were first dating, she was just appalled. The Sedgwick County Zoo has cows in it. Why would you put cows in a zoo, she said. You can see cows anywhere you go. Now, there's good reason. It's a breeding program. It's stocks that aren't around. It's cows from around the world. But at the face of it, why, why would you have to go to the zoo to see a cow? Some of us, where does our food come from? Some of us engaging in larger cities in New York where my brother now lives, in Chicago, in LA, you can forget where your food comes from. Where the meat that graces our table is processed, butchered, raised. And many of you are old enough to remember when we truly did eat seasonally. We are wealthy enough even here in Bourbon County, which is one of the poorest counties in the state of Kansas, but collectively we are welcome, wealthy enough that if we want an orange or a tangerine or a grape or a strawberry, we can get those anytime. G&W, Walmart will both have those on the shelf almost year round. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be you only had those that were a delicacy when they were in season and then you didn't have that. Where does your food come from? Who's involved in growing it, collecting it? How are they paid? Where does their food come from? What's their income? There is justice work to be done in food. But the debate in our scriptures today is actually much more basic than that. This is a mural in Jerusalem of the Cardo marketplace as it may have appeared in the first century and one of the things I really love about this mural if you look in the lower right hand corner there is a native a Palestinian girl handing a fruit to what looks like a modern tourist we have bridged the history the gap we are still in this same marketplace we are still sharing the same food 
the bounty of God's abundance. We are connected even across great distances and great time. Where does our food come from? And the debate in the first century, especially for Jews, was has it been sacrificed to an idol? See, much of the food, and especially the meat, but even the vegetables would have been processed not the way we do with chemicals and additives, some of which are a great bounty to humanity and some of which, frankly, have made some of our foods not very nutritious at all. Much of the U.S. lives in what scientists call food deserts. I have, for a variety of reasons, basically been without a car for about a month. We've had some things go on. We loaned my son a car, his truck's broken down, and I live in Fort Scott, and I a block from the house. I don't really need to drive. But the other day, I needed to get to Walmart for something, and I started to go, and I no, no, I don't have a car. And then I laughed at myself, because Robin and I just spent some time in vacation on, in Chicago, and the distance from this building to Walmart in Chicago, you wouldn't even think about bothering to get on the L. It's just a mile and a half, no big deal. My mental map of Chicago and how far I'm willing to walk for something is very, very different than my mental map of Fort Scott, Kansas. But I'm the same person. And yeah, you know, I was thinking as I was thinking, I'm not sure there's a sidewalk to Walmart, really. And I'm in reasonably good shape. But what if I weren't in so good shape and I didn't have a car? Where does my food come from? How far is it to G&W? Who can get me there? Robin and I spent the four years before we came here in a wonderful little town called Pretty Prairie, Kansas. Pretty Prairie, Kansas has one restaurant that is open Wednesday through Saturday, and the nearest grocery store is in Kingman. It's a solid 25 miles away. Where does my food come from? Before that, we lived in Wichita, and we were literally around the corner from a Dillon's. And I used to joke, we could be making tacos. Okay, she could be making tacos. And we would realize that we were out of sour cream, and I could go get sour cream and be back before the meat was done browning. My food was right there. We moved to Pretty Prairie. We had to start planning. Because if we ran out of sour cream, there wasn't any sour cream. It's going to take an hour to get some sour cream. But if you don't have a car, where's your food come from? And there are large sections of our state and our country that are food deserts because there's not an accessible source of food. We're not bad off here in Fort Scott, but even then, there, there are challenges. Back in the first century, food had been processed by worshiping one of the gods. And of course, we know there is only one god. None of that really mattered. They're just stone carvings. It doesn't make a difference. But it does. Especially if you're concerned about whether what you're eating is somehow worshiping a false idol. And idolatry is sin, and what we eat matters. And how it was processed matters. That's the essence of the kosher law, is how was the food handled? Has it been handled in a way that is worthy of and worshipful to God? Well, if you're in a culture where there are numerous gods and other people have used that food to worship their god, inherently you consuming it worships their god, which is forbidden. But Paul says, but there's one god. We know there's one god. None of that matters. You're free. Grace has made you free from the law of sin and death. Don't worry about it. Unless... Your doing so would cause someone else who doesn't quite understand grace yet to stumble. See, what we do matters deeply, even to Paul. But the moment we make doing it our way the qualification of faith, we've rejected God's grace. It's tricky. It's hard. We debate. What do we believe? How do we live it out? How do we share it with others? And I don't think we understand in our culture what it meant to eat with others. Now, I'm just old enough to remember family dinners at grandma's house. Something perhaps lamentably that our 
culture is largely losing, or even family dinner. But who you, meet, who you eat with mattered in the first century. Who was around the table? How often did Jesus get in trouble for eating with sinners? By which the Pharisees were accusing him of sitting at a table with people who were not worthy to sit at the table. Now Jesus made a point of sitting at those tables. And there were cultural rules about what position around the table had what kind of honor. You know, don't seek the head place for your host might move you down and you'd be embarrassed. Take the lowest place and wait for your host to move you. You remember these stories? These stories are deeply rooted in the culture of the time. Now, maybe at a fancy banquet we have a head table or a wedding, but most of the time we don't think about it. In fact, in our culture, this is an image from my childhood from McDonald's. That's two tables, ladies and gentlemen. You can sit at those two tables and be completely disconnected from the other person. No conversation, no acknowledgement. That's a whole different table. Because you don't see there's an there's a inch and a half gap there, even though they have the same leg. Our culture treats who we eat with very, very differently than the first century. And yet who we eat with matters. Peter had this vision, Peter kill and eat, the unclean foods that led him not to reject the dietary laws, but to recognize that Gentiles could be included. But then in our readings today, we realize that Peter and Paul had an encounter in Galatia. See, Peter had had that experience. He'd gone, as I read at the beginning, back to the saints in Jerusalem. He'd told them about the spirit falling on the Galatians, about them being back, excuse me, on the Gentiles, being baptized together, recognizing our commonality in Christ. But then by the time he got to the Galatia, he kept eating with Gentiles, and then James people showed up, and he was embarrassed, sorry, I'll only go with my group. Got to respect that boundary. Maybe he just didn't want to upset James, it was easier, but he upset Paul. No, this is, this is a rejection of God's grace. Saying uh, you can only eat certain food in a certain place with certain people. You've rejected God's inclusive love. Our debates matter. Some of us are wrong, and it matters. And yet when we get too full of our own self-righteousness, of our own answers, even when we're right, we reject the grace of God. We stop seeing the person we disagree with as a beloved child of God. 9-11 you know, was the horrific example of what happens when that kind of zealotry goes too far. We can disagree on important matters, but we can't turn into fundamentalists. We can't turn into zealots. We can't, as Paul once did, decide that our understanding enables us to persecute others, which makes us weak. Of course, God's glory is revealed in weakness we've talked about. God's glory is revealed in the transformation of the cross and the breaking of the bread. One of the reasons Peter and Paul's disagreement is so sharp that we have again lost is we think of communion as a once a month thing that we do, a little bit of bread, a tiny bit of juice. But in the first century, communion was the meal. Yes, there were a specific ritual around some bread and a cup, but it was the meal that was shared. That's why so often in Paul's letters, he writes about the importance of the shared meal. You know, in our culture, we'll often hear people quote, that let them who will not work not eat. And we think it's about the poor and the lazy, but it's not. We'll probably come back to this in a few weeks because it's so important. When Paul is writing that to the Corinthian church, and it's not in the part we read today, but What's happening is the rich are gathering, they're sharing the meal, they're sharing communion, the poor and the working class are still out in the fields, the rich are actually becoming drunk, 
They're eating all the food. There's nothing left. So by the time the workers get off work and they get to, the, to this Christian celebration, the food's all gone. Let those who are not working not eat yet. Wait. Share communion. It's one of the root reasons that we in the United Methodist Church have elders preside at communion. My responsibility is to make sure we're all gathered, that people aren't being excluded. How we do things matters. Last week, after I preached, Christian Bishop wrote me a note and said, you ought to read this book. Have a Little Faith by Mitch Albom. I'd read several of his books, and I'm still trying to figure out. There were three chapters of this book at different places that I was very familiar with, but I had not read the book. I must have read a summary at some point when it was published uh, back in 2009. But it's basically the story of his childhood rabbi, who at, at Mitch Albom, if you don't know, he was a writer for the Detroit Free Press. He was a, a sports columnist and a general columnist brilliant writer, had become fairly famous uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, well known, fairly well off, spent a lot of time in New York and Detroit, he'd go back and forth. He'd grown up in New Jersey and he goes back and he makes a speaking event uh, after one of his books is published and his childhood rabbi comes to the speaking event and after the event he comes up, reintroduces himself and says, will you do my eulogy? Mitch, at that point, hadn't been back to synagogue for decades. And the rabbi of his childhood asked him to do his eulogy. And it throws him for a loop. The book is all about them becoming reacquainted and Mitch's own wrestling with what it means to be a person of faith, a man of God. And to write this eulogy. And they wind up taking eight years. The rabbi, when he asks, isn't anywhere close to death, but he... He's doing something for Mitch and for himself. And then the book is intertwined with the story of Pastor Henry Covington. He's a felon, an ex-felon, an ex-drug addict, recovering drug addict. He runs a homeless shelter called My Brother's Keeper in an abandoned cathedral in Detroit with a big hole in the roof. And Mitch gets to know him, and the chapters kind of interplay his own wrestling, his own decision whether he can trust this guy, who by his own admission has relapsed multiple times, was a drug dealer, was involved in a murder, went to prison for a while. Can Mitch afford to give him the funds to fix the roof or do other things that his contacts could easily arrange? And he winds up spending multiple years getting to know Henry and his ministry and the people his life has affected and building trust. It's a powerful book. But one of the things that struck me, I hadn't read this part of the book before, but the rabbi tells Mitch a story about heaven and hell. And this story is found in multiple different cultures and slight variations. There's some wonderful videos of it and tech was not cooperating this morning so I punted. But there was a, even a Sesame Street version at one point. Wait a minute, is that gonna work? No, okay. Um, there was a Sesame Street version in 1973, one of the first years of Sesame Street. The Griefel arms are stuck straight up and he can't bend his arms and feed himself. And the uh, Gorb's arms are stuck straight out and he can't feed himself or reach the fruit. But they figure out the Griefel can reach the fruit and bend over and feed the Gorf, and the Gorf can hold the fruit and feed the Griefel, and they cooperate. <laughs> That's the story. The way the rabbi tells it is there's a great banquet. The person arrives, and there's this great banquet, and they're excited at the banquet, but everybody at the table has these long implements, and they can't, they can't feed themselves. And they fight, and they struggle. But eventually they figure out, well, they leave that. That's hell. The great banquet, but you can't eat any of it. Heaven is exactly the same scene, but there they're using the utensils to feed one another. They're cooperating. They're sharing God's bounty. The only exactly the same setting, 
But are we looking out for ourselves and fighting or are we cooperating even amongst our differences and our disagreements? That's communion. That's the church. Sometimes we do need to draw boundaries, but we always need to remember that our boundaries are frail and temporary, that Christ is the boundary function, not us, not our preferences, not our understandings. Everyone we meet is a beloved child of God. Everyone we meet. We're wrong about some things, and so are they. Everyone we meet is a beloved child of God worthy to respond to Christ's invitation to the banquet. One of the best things we do here at First United Methodist Church is feeding families. Over 11 years, we've been hosting this meal. It started out literally a group around a table, and there's some real advantages to that. But it got so big, and then COVID hit, we couldn't keep doing it in building for a lot of ways, but we kept it going, and we moved to a to-go model where you come by and you pick it up so it was sanitary and distant. One of the things that has struck me over the last year of being one of the minor volunteers in this effort that goes beyond our church, there's what, five other churches and a couple community groups that help out and then countless people that donate in various ways to make this ministry possible that we might feed our neighbors. One of the things that strikes me is it's so often not really about the food really about the food. Yes, the core mission is to feed hungry people. There are way too many people in our town that are food insecure. We might not be a food desert, but they can't get to the grocery store or the money isn't there this month. But more it's about the human relationships. I was talking with one man. He has the means, but he never really learned to cook. There's some serious health problems in his family. It's just nice once a week to not have to deal with it, to come to get the meal. He has in his neighborhood a couple other people that help feed his family. They, bring, they cook extra for their family and they bring it to him. And he's so grateful for that. And he barters with them in various ways. But one of those people was sick a couple of weeks ago. And he was coming through the line getting his meal like he always does. And his and his family he usually picks up three. And he went, I wonder if they'd let me get one for her. Well, of course we'd let, her get one, let him get one for her. In fact, Robin was talking with him and got out of him that the person who was sick had a couple family members in coming from there. So there's three in the household. So you need three meals, not one. So we gave him six that night. And he took them over to this other family that usually cares for him. And he took the meals. And she said, it was so nice not to have to cook. That neighborhood is now expanding their own little food ministry. They've learned other people that are hungry. He's picked, he picked up eight last week to distribute. And the other person is providing meals for a few folks that we have nothing to do with, but we sparked the generosity. We sparked the human connection. For so many of the people that come through that line on a Wednesday night, it really isn't about the meal. It's about getting out of the house and talking with somebody because they don't have anybody else to talk to and a phone call isn't the same thing. Feeding families is as much about stomachs as it is souls. Making human connections. It's not about whether you can afford a meal. The other thing that happens, I cherish when people who come to, through that line that have a car that is maybe a little nicer, it's obvious that it's not money that is the issue. Because what that does, there is a stigma in our society of asking for help. And there are a lot of people in Fort Scott that have the means two years ago, but they don't now, but they still look like they do, and they're afraid to ask for the help. There are a lot of people in Fort Scott that are isolated and lonely, and they're afraid to reach out because mental health has a stigma. Loneliness has a stigma. Isolation, not working all the time, has a stigma. What do you do when you're retired and your family lives far away and you can't work because of health or whatever? How do you build connection? Feeding families is one way we can do that. And when that nicer car comes through, what it does is give permission for those who are just on the edge of desperation to come and see if they could get a meal too. 
and I am so proud of this community that the answer is yes. The other practical thing is if we drew a line, because we're up to about 400 meals a week and it's taxing our volunteers and it's a lot and it's expensive. And we tend to fall back into that, well, who really deserves one? Who really needs one? Who's taking advantage? The problem is we need these connections. We need to serve. Others need to eat. If we tried to draw a line and say, okay, you've got to have lower than this income, all the government program stuff, do you have any idea the amount of paperwork we'd have to do to enforce that? And all of a sudden, we're spending tons of volunteer time doing paperwork instead of doing human connection. And that's the point. Because it's the communion table. It's the church. Not that they have to be like us, not that they have to worship like us, but that's the church, the breaking of the bread, the handing over of the meal, the sharing, the trusting, the being vulnerable. If we're not doing that, we're not being the church. We're not being the beloved community of God. What we do on Wednesday nights should influence what we do on Sunday mornings and Monday mornings. Not everyone can cook that night, not everyone can serve, but all of us are called to be serving in some way, some way that builds us up and builds others up, that nourishes us, not drains us. That's what being the church is, and we need differences of opinion, differences of practice, differences of call and gifts. We don't all have to do the same thing the same way. In fact, if we did, we wouldn't be the church. That's what I believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is, Take My Life and Let It Be. It's number 399 in the hymnal. There are 
a number of announcements on the back of the bulletin. In particular, I want to call your attention to uh, the Ice Cream Social coming up next Sunday at 6 o'clock. The UMW is going to prepare or pre provide the ice cream. We are invited to bring friends and make a free will donation. And uh, Jan is also going to spend a little, uh, share just a little bit about what's going on with UMW. I'm going to tell you that I put a note in his announcement basket, and it said, Jan Hedges, UMW, so you don't forget with a happy face. <laughs> now, I know he wouldn't really forget me, would he? <laughs> um, anyway, I know that um, some of you have heard us mention over the last few weeks, and, and we had an article in the newsletter talking about UMW and the future of UMW. A United Methodist Women, and just like the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Women has also undergone a number of different name changes through the 150, 175 years, however long it is we've been around. It's been a long time. And we were also faced with some issues that I think all congregations and many organizations are facing is that we are aging, and, you know, their reluctance for to step up and be a leader, to take a leadership role. And so it was a time for us as United Methodist Women, our name officially will change in, De in January 2023 to become United Women of Faith, for us to take a hard look at our local organization, our local unit to say, are we still willing to be United Women of Faith, United Methodist Women, whatever name they want to give us? Are we still willing to do what it takes to step forward and to provide our goals of justice and uh, care for women and children of the world, not just our community, but of the world? What is our mission? Do we still believe in mission strongly enough to move forward as United Methodist Women or United Women of Faith? And I would like to share with you that on Thursday we had that meeting uh, to make the official vote. We had had a lengthy discussion the month before and on Thursday we voted unanimously, I would say by secret ballot, but it was unanimous that we should continue. So I want you to just give the women of this congregation a hand and say thank you. Thank you for being willing to continue forward with our mission of serving women and children of the world and in, especially in our community. We meet throughout the year. We have programs to help enrich our own lives but we will be reaching out in many ways, as many ways as we can, to enrich the lives of others. And we hope that any woman in our congregation or in our community who wants to join us will please do that. Our next meeting, here's my plug, our next meeting is October the 13th at 1.30 here in the church, and Dorothy Kibbett will be in charge of the program that day, and we are excited to move forward to the next. 150 years in United Methodist Women. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And then I commend you to read the uh, rest of the announcements on the back there. There's information, uh, the altar flowers today are in honor of Don and Jean Tucker's family. And uh, fish fry is coming up on October 2nd and lots of good things happening. And there's a little bit of information about Shepherd Center and I will be sharing quite a bit more about that in uh, the next couple of weeks. Basically, it is an effort to address the isolation and the loneliness that we see among retired elders in Fort Scott and revitalize our congregation and use the gift of the building. And so on October 14th, we'll be having several speakers and different breakout groups and inviting everyone from the community, especially those retired adults, to have some fellowship and continue with lifelong learning. So with that, let us move on into prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the energy in this place. We thank you for all those that have contributed to build this community of faith here in Fort Scott, known by many names, 
filled with all sorts of disagreements and yet united in mission, in ministry, in this place where you have planted us, nourished us, where you call us to be Christ to our neighbors. And we pray these things in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us these words we now share together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward and collect this day's part of our tithes and offerings. Please join in the prayer of dedication. Gracious and holy God, accept what we offer today, our checks and cash, our faltering steps, our brokenness, our leftovers, our hope, our risking, our lives. Bless and transform all that we offer and all that we hold back, that new life may be ours, and in becoming ours, be truly shared with others to celebrate together in the diverse community of people called in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of parting is, uh, And Are We Yet Alive, number 553 in the hymnal.
paths need not be the same because our Creator is the same. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, God is with us and for us. God's grace surrounds us and God's grace sends us forth. Go in peace.